thank you so much for being here. Um, before I introduce Dr. Isaacs, I'm just going to share uh, just a few words about Healing Strong. You've probably seen our uh, lime green signs all over the place this past weekend. It is a, um, it is a volunteer-driven group started by cancer survivors who have chosen um, various ways to uh, heal themselves. And I have been on both sides of the aisle, allopathic, I'm uh, a nurse, and I have also been on the aisle of grabbing my doctor's hand and saying, what do I do? How do I help in my healing journey? So we started this after an initial uh, meeting and Susie, who's out in the lobby, will tell you more about it. And the reason I want to bring it up is particularly for you uh, health practitioners, I'm sure you have had your patients grab your hand and go, what do I do? How, how do I support my health? And how do I support my healing? Well, if you get a chance, go talk to Susie. Uh, we started off with one support group. And I don't like to call it support group. I like to call it an educational group because that's really what we do. We started off with cancer survivors. We now have people who are dealing with chronic health issues. And we are also have a lot more people coming in who don't have any active health issues, but are just more interested in really supporting their health. And uh, lots of young people, which is very exciting. Uh, so anyway, if you get a chance, go out and speak with Susie in the lobby. And we have, how many uh, groups do we have now? 13 test groups, we have a curriculum of 12, um, 12 lessons, which is sort of a jumping off point. We do not tell people how to heal. They choose how they're going to heal, but we do support what they've chosen. So if you get a chance, it's a great way to um, uh, bring about, as health practitioners, something that you can offer them. So I'm going to introduce Dr. Linda Isaacs. We are thrilled to have her here in Gainesville today. Dr. Linda Isaacs received her Bachelor of Science degree from the University of Kentucky, graduated with high distinction with a major in biochemistry. She was elected to Phi Beta Kappa. She subsequently received her medical degree from Vanderbilt University School of Medicine. She is certified by the American Board of Internal Medicine, completing recertification most recently in 2011. Dr. Isaacs worked with her colleague, Dr. Nicholas J. Gonzalez, for more than 20 years using a nutritional approach for treating patients diagnosed with cancer and other serious degenerative illnesses. They co-authored journal articles, including a lengthy case report article and the book, The Trophoblast and the Origins of Cancer. Since his untimely death, she is continuing with the work they shared. The individualized programs involve diet, which can range from almost exclusively vegetarian to one that is heavy in animal protein and fat, nutritional supplement protocols, which may include large doses of pancreatic enzymes, and cleansing procedures to help the body rid itself of metabolic wastes. We are honored to have Dr. Isaacs join us this morning. Thank you for that kind introduction, and I really appreciated it because it gave a summation of the kind of work that I do and that Dr. Gonzalez and I shared. Before I get into any of it, um, I do want to just, it's funny, I always think I won't get choked up, and then I do. Um, I do want to briefly acknowledge Dr. Gonzalez. Um, he and I worked together for in the neighborhood of 30 years, and it's still hard for me to believe that he's gone. But most of the, much of what I'm gonna talk about today was actually work that he initiated before I actually met him. And um, he and I got into this line of work, not because of elaborate theories, but because we had learned about case reports of patients that had done extraordinarily well, treated with the kind of work that I'm, talk I'm going to be talking about today. Um, a line that I've heard in my orthodox training was, in God we trust, all others must provide data. And, um, and so what I'm going to do is start off with a case report of a patient um, from Dr. Gonzalez's practice who's the kind of patient that helped keep us motivated to do what we do. Um, this woman in November of 1986 had a lumpectomy. 
And then in July of 1989, she had another lumpectomy on the other side. But at that time, because of some blood work abnormalities, they did a metastatic workup to look and see if the disease had spread anywhere else. And they found that she had disease in her liver. Um, so they biopsied it. It was, it was definitely metastatic breast cancer. And she got three cycles of chemotherapy, which made her so sick that she absolutely refused to proceed. Um, in April of 1990, she came in to see Dr. Gonzalez, and um, at that time she had pain in her liver that was so bad that she required morphine. And she, even though she'd had the lump out in her breast, she had regrown a new lump in the same area. So she went on her nutritional program, came in to see him in May of 1991, and the, the pain in her liver was completely gone. She felt great. And she felt so good that she went home and a month later decided that she was cured and she stopped her program. In July, she wound up in the emergency room because she had a seizure. They scanned her head and found that she had two brain metastases. She called up Dr. Gonzalez, Nick, I guess I should say, um, uh, and she was com obviously completely terrified. Um, they were telling her that she needed to get immediate treatment, although nobody was promising her a cure if she did, because metastatic breast cancer can be treated but not cured uh, then and now. Uh, so I, re I remember this conversation from Nick's end anyway, because I was sitting in the office. I had just finished up my internal medicine residency, and I was sitting in the office listening to him return phone calls. I learned a lot that way. And he very calmly told her, look, you just need to get back on your program. You shouldn't have stopped it, but don't worry. Just get back on your program. Get back on your program. He repeated that a few times, hung up the phone and said, why did she stop her program? Um, but she got back on her program, and in April of 1992, she had uh, both head and abdominal CTs, and everything was completely clear. This woman is still alive. She doesn't come into the office anymore, um, but a mutual acquaintance told me that she ran into her in the city where they live about a year ago, and that she was walking down the street with her children and her grandchildren, looking fabulously healthy. This woman had been in her mid-40s at the time of the original diagnosis, and had told this mutual acquaintance that she really didn't expect to see 50. She didn't really expect to see her children grow up. So that's the kind of case that keeps us doing what we do. And when I graduated from Vanderbilt Medical School, I already knew at that time that my career path was going to be a little bit different than my classmates because I had already met Dr. Nicholas Gonzalez. He was the intern on the internal medicine team that I was assigned to as a third year medical student. So we worked together for six weeks. And he was a brilliant physician, always very quick, uh, always very efficient. His patients loved him. He was also always one of the first ones out the door at the end of the day. And it turned out that it wasn't just that he wanted to escape from the hospital, although most of us did. Um, it was because he was already engaged in a research project of his own, because a few years earlier he'd met a man named Dr. William Donald Kelly. Now, Nick had been a journalist before he went to medical school. He actually had interviewed a number of the luminaries of the day, like Dr. Linus Pauling, Dr. Robert Atkins, and some of those practitioners had actually encouraged him to go ahead and go to medical school. And he went with the goal of studying nutrition. What happened in 1981 or thereabouts was that um, uh, Nick had been introduced to Dr. Kelly by a mutual acquaintance from his journalism days. That person was thinking about doing a book on Dr. Kelly and uh, wanted Nick to vet him to see if he was really worth that investigation. Um, what Nick discovered was a man who seemed absolutely brilliant about medicine and about nutrition. And so Nick was the one that wound up writing the book. Apparently, his, uh, the friend that introduced him did eventually forgive him. Um, but uh, but he, he wound up investigating Dr. Kelly's work himself. So this picture is from Nick's fourth year of medical school um, when he was out at Dr. Kelly's farm in, uh, in the state of Washington. Um, working on this investigation. And in the course of it, Nick reviewed 10,000 patient charts. Now bear in mind, this was back in the era of paper charts. It wasn't a matter of leafing through computer records. It was going through actual paper. 
He sent questionnaires to 1,300 of them, and based on that information, he interviewed 450 at length by phone. Then uh, he chose 50 of them to put together in monograph form to represent cases of patients with remarkable outcomes um, who had a wide variety of different cancer types. So here again, I'll do a few more case reports from that particular book. Here is a woman who was diagnosed in 1970 with infiltrating carcinoma on one side, and she had a radical mastectomy. And this was the bad old days when they did major, major operations, and that's what she had. Then a few years later, she developed cancer in the other breast, and she was around 40 years old at this time. Um, so she had developed cancer on both sides, and then Within the year, she started to develop terrible fatigue and pain in her back that was so bad that she was having trouble getting dressed. She had a hard time getting her doctors to take her complaints seriously, but eventually they did do a bone scan, and it showed uptake uh, indicating probable, almost certain metastases in her skull and also in her right scapula, um, her, her shoulder blade, um, which would explain why she was having so much trouble getting dressed. Now, she had an oophorectomy. They removed the ovaries, which would help with symptoms. It's a method of hormone control, in effect. But no one claimed that that would cure her. She had metastatic disease. Uh, that same summer, she started the Kelly program. And at the time that Nick interviewed her in, this, uh, in the mid, you know, around 1981, 82, in that ten general territory, she was alive and she was feeling great. Now, just out of curiosity, in August, I actually tried to track her down. She has an unusual last name, and I knew where she lived. I looked her up on Google, and I gave her a call, and she is still alive. She's, doing, she's alive, she's doing great, and she is very, very grateful to Dr. Kelly and to Dr. Gonzalez and myself for keeping this work alive. Another patient, 1969, diagnosed with uterine cancer. She had radiation and surgery. Most of the time, that cures uterine cancer, but not in her case. In 1975, she had a pelvic mass removed. It, they were afraid it was going to obstruct her intestinal tract. Um, but they also, at the same time, did a chest x-ray, which showed a number of little spots in her lungs that hadn't been there before. Presumption, metastatic disease. Um, and so she was started on a medication to try to treat that, but again, nobody thought that would cure her, and in fact, what it did was make her sick. She started to feel worse, so she stopped it, and she went on the Kelly program. Eleven years later, at the time Nick was doing his research, she was alive and well and doing just fine. A follow-up chest x-ray in the interim had shown that all of those little spots had resolved on her treatment. And she, with, again, with the internet, we were able to find that she passed away in 2009 at age 95. So she outlived the diagnosis of metastatic cancer by something in the neighborhood of 30 years. 30 months would have been remarkable. 30 weeks would have been more typical. She outlived her diagnosis of metastatic uterine cancer by many, many, many years and died at age 95. Um, in the course of his research, Nick also went through all of Dr. Kelly's records looking for people with pancreatic cancer. And you'll hear pancreatic cancer a lot in the course of this discussion. Um, sometimes people assume that because we use pancreatic enzymes and we talk about pancreatic cancer, that that's the only kind of cancer we treat. That's not correct. We have used historically pancreatic cancer as a kind of a research tool simply because the outcome with pancreatic pancreatic cancer is unfortunately rather uniformly nasty. Um, there's, there can be a wide variation in the natural history of something like breast cancer, although you know, the, the, the types of survivals that I described for these two patients here is clearly remarkable. But sometimes women with just metastases of the bone, for example, can live quite a long time. And some cases of breast cancer can be rapidly terminal. So it makes it harder to study breast cancer, not as uniform. But when you look at pancreatic cancer, there's no slow-growing pancreatic cancer. If it's adenocarcinoma, it's bad. And so what Nick did was he went through Dr. Kelly's records looking for the cases of uh, proven pancreatic cancer and comparing their compliance with their outcomes. 
And so what he found, as you can see, there were 10 patients that came to see Dr. Kelly that never did any aspect of the protocol whatsoever, partly in some cases because of lack of family support or physician opposition. And the, median, the mean survival for those patients was 63 days, which is pretty typical. The next column followed partially. They did part of it, or they did it for a while, um, and that group had a mean survival of 302 days, so nearly a year. The patients that had followed it completely um, had a mean survival of 8.2 years at the time that, the, that Nick wrapped up his investigation. And in fact, this number would be considerably longer at this point because one of those patients is still alive. Um, so Nick put all this together in a monograph form, which is actually available through Amazon if you're interested in getting it, called One Man Alone, and that's describing his investigation of Dr. Kelly. So uh, sometimes people will wonder, and, and again, I'm not really sure who my audience is this morning, so there might be some medical people saying, well, maybe it's just spontaneous regression of cancer. And spontaneous regression is not a particularly common phenomenon. Now, based on some of the studies that are being done with the concept of overdiagnosis of things like breast cancer, thyroid cancer, et cetera, and perhaps spontaneous regression of early stage disease is a lot more common than we might have previously thought. But when you're talking about metastatic disease, that's a whole nother question. There haven't been a lot of formal studies on it, but the ones that have been done suggested that the incidence rate is something like one in 60,000 to one in 100,000. One investigator wrote that the likelihood of any one practitioner seeing more than three cases of spontaneous regression in their lifetime was so small as to be statistically impossible. Uh, another uh, comment about articles on spontaneous regression is that they usually don't mention whether the patient is doing something that the patient feels might have had an impact on their disease. Um, as a couple of examples for that, Dr. Kelly told Nick that there was a study of spontaneous regression in non-Hodgkin's lymphoma that was published in the 1970s um, from Stanford, actually, that actually contained a number of Kelly patients. But the doctors never asked or never credited what the patients said they were doing about their illness. Another article that I read recently about a spontaneous regression case of lung cancer, it mentioned the patients said he was taking some herbs, and that's what he said did the job, but we all know that herbs don't cure cancer, so we don't really need to talk about what those herbs are. Of course, I'm paraphrasing here, but that was a general idea. I personally would have liked to have known what those herbs were. And I also think that uh, investigating spontaneous regression and what those people were actually doing might have a huge impact um, if someone were to do it. So um, who then was Dr. Kelly? Uh, and I'd like to get into a little bit of his story as a way of talking about the different aspects of our treatment and what the support is for that, aside from the case reports, which for me getting involved in this line of work was enough. Um, Dr. Kelly was an orthodontist by training. He had an academic interest in nutrition, so to speak, because while he had read a lot of the interesting work by dentists over the years, people like Weston Price, for example, who studied the impact of nutrition on teeth and on human health. But Dr. Kelly had what you might call an academic interest in the sense that he was eating junk food while he was reading his nutrition books. But his interest got a lot more practical when he was in his late 30s. This would have been the early 1960s, and he became ill. Eventually, he was diagnosed with what was almost certainly pancreatic cancer. I say almost certainly because this was the early 1960s. There were no CAT scans. There were no needle biopsies. And so when his doctors were presented with a patient who had lost about 150, or, I'm sorry, 50 pounds, and had a tumor sticking out of his abdomen, they didn't think it was necessary to take him to the operating room to make the diagnosis of pancreatic cancer. Based on his history, based on what was happening, they said, that's what you've got. You're not long for this world. Get your affairs in order. Well, he had four young children. He was only in his late 30s, and he felt like he needed to figure out something in addition to getting his affairs in order. And so the first thing he did was put himself on a vegetarian diet. Um, he did include, as I understand it, some eggs. 
Um, apparently, to the mortification of his children, he installed a goat in the backyard for, so he could have goat milk. But he also was doing quite a lot of raw vegetables, of juicing of various kinds. And on this regimen, his, his uh, status stabilized. He didn't get magically better, but neither was he getting worse. And given that he seemed like he was getting worse on a daily basis before he changed his diet, he kept going with that. But he was still having terrible, terrible digestive problems. And so he went to the local pharmacy and said, do you have any suggestions? And they said, yes, what you need is to try some pancreatic enzymes. So at this point, I'll just do a brief discussion of what enzymes actually are. Um, enzymes are, according to the, the, the definition on Wikipedia, actually, they are macromolecular biological catalysts. What does that mean? Well, they're very large molecules that a catalyst is something that helps a reaction to occur. So for example, breaking down glucose to form energy. If you just put the ingredients in a test tube and wait a thousand years or so, you'll get some of that to happen. But with a catalyst, like an enzyme, it works. It kind of collects the different parts of the reaction and as, as we would, as our biochemistry teachers would say, there was a conformational change and magically everything would change and the, the, the products that would come out would be the result of that chemical reaction that had been facilitated by this enzyme. So they enable the reactions to happen in, your, in our bodies fast enough to sustain life. Without enzymes, we can't do anything. There's more than 5,000 types of reactions that are described uh, that are managed by enzymes, and almost all of them are actually made out of protein. Now, uh, enzymes are absolutely critical for nutrition, and I'll be talking a little bit more about that, but the digestive enzymes secreted by the pancreas, for example, include um, proteases, which digest proteins, lipases, which take care of fat, and amylase, which takes care of starches. And one, uh, one, one person who's commonly quoted in the context of nutrition is a Dr. Edward Howe. Um, he was a practitioner in the 30s and 40s primarily, but he wrote some very, very interesting books that are still available, um, like the book Enzyme Nutrition. And some of the comments that he made, cooking destroys enzymes. So raw foods then potentially contain the enzymes within them that can help your body digest them. So when you eat a raw food, you're also eating the enzymes that can help your body work on them, and also those enzymes can perform other functions for us. And how believe that when we eat raw foods, we don't have to make as many enzymes ourselves. And he felt that since enzymes are what keep us alive, keep us going, that whenever we can save energy by not having to make enzymes ourselves, it just helps us maintain our health. Howell himself lived to be 89, so I guess that's a, a pretty good recommendation for what he was saying. Now, so going back to pancreatic enzymes then, um, the pharmacist recommended pancreatic enzymes to Dr. Kelly because Kelly was having these terrible digestive problems. And pancreatic enzymes in conventional physiology are believed to be something that can just help with digestion of food. And it's believed that that is their only role. So Kelly took home all of these enzymes and he started taking large amounts because he was desperate. He was filled with gas and indigestion and what he found is that they helped. But he started taking them all day long, not only with meals, but in between meals. And what he found was that the nature, the character of the tumor that was sticking out of his abdomen started to change. He could feel it softening, he could feel it changing character. And so being scientifically trained, he then went to see if anybody else had ever said anything about the possibility that pancreatic enzymes might have a role in cancer. And what he found was the work of a man named Dr. John Beard. Now, Dr. Beard was an embryologist by training, which means that he was studying the earliest stages of development in man and in other animals. In fact, his doctoral dissertation was about the development of a particular type of fish. Um, but by the time that, uh, of the, the information that's relevant to what I'm talking about here, he had gotten interested in the development of mammals. And again, that would include humans and other types of animals. And specifically, he was interested in a tissue that's called the trophoblast. 
The trophoblast is the early stage of the embryo that is the precursor to the placenta. And the trophoblast's job is to latch on to the mother's uterus to invade into it and to create a blood supply. And what Beard realized was that under the microscope and in its behavior, the trophoblast looked and acted a lot like a cancer. The trophoblast has to attach itself to the uterus and work its way in. The trophoblast has to create a blood supply so that it can exchange nutrients and waste with the mother's circulation so the baby can, can get the food supply, the oxygen, all of that that it needs. And the trophoblast has to trick the mother's immune system into ignoring it because the baby's genetic makeup is only half the mother's, the other half is the father. The baby genetically is very, very different from the mother. But the, ba the mother doesn't reject the baby. Why? Well, because the trophoblast and the placenta kind of fool the immune system into leaving it alone. Cancer also invades. Cancer also creates an immune supply. Cancer also tricks the immune system into thinking there's nothing to react to here. But there's one big difference. Cancer keeps going. The trophoblast stops. At a certain point in development, the trophoblast stops invading, matures into the final form, the placenta, and then at the time of delivery, after the baby is born, the placenta neatly peels itself off and is delivered in turn so that the uterus is available for another pregnancy down the road. But cancer just keeps going. And, and Beard theorized that if he could figure out what the signal was that made the trophoblast stop invading, and, and mature, then maybe he would come up with an answer to cancer. Beard also believed that the origin of cancer was what he called wayward trophoblast cells. And he believed that some of the cells of the trophoblast in the early stages of development, that they don't all go to where the placenta is going to form, that some of them were scattered through the body in various organs to serve as a reserve for new cells to be formed as they are needed. What he was in effect describing is what's now known as stem cells. But this was all Beard's speculation. What he needed to do next was figure out what is that signal. And what he did was look at a large number of specimens of, of a lot of different species. And what he found across the board was that the uh, trophoblast stopped its invasion and matured at the same time that the baby started making pancreatic enzymes. Now, if pancreatic enzymes are only used for digestion, then there's really no reason for the baby to be making them at two months of gestation, which is about when um, this is happening. But if the enzymes are vital to rein in the trophoblast, so to speak, then it's very, very important that that baby start making enzymes then. Baby's not going to see a meal for another seven months. But if the enzymes are used to modify the behavior of the trophoblast, that's a really important thing because if the trophoblast just keeps going, it could work its way right through the uterus and kill the mother and the baby. No good for anybody. Now, Beard was not a physician. He was a scientist. So he really was not in a position to try out his treatment for himself. Pancreatic enzymes were actually available in that era as an injectable form because they were used to work on the membrane that would form in the back of the throat for diphtheria patients. So there, they were in existence, but Beard was really only able to put that into practice. Um, if you look on the upper section there, you'll see there's a, a a little blurb from an article that Beard wrote when he tried enzymes out in a mouse model of cancer. And he got some very positive results. And so based on his theories plus the, the mouse experiment, a number of physicians tried out injectable pancreatic enzymes in their patients. And quite a number of them got very, very good results. There's some remarkable papers from that era. But there were some doctors who tried this out, and it didn't work very well. And so there was a lot of back and forth about why that might be. And all of it is summed up in Dr. Beard's 1911 book called The Enzyme Treatment of cancer and its scientific basis. Now Beard's argument was that when the enzymes didn't work, that it was simple. The doctors were not using good quality enzymes. Bear in mind that refrigeration in this era was really something that was only used by large meat packing plants. In other words, it 
to get a refrigerated environment, you needed massive equipment. Your typical doctor was either working with an icebox or with nothing in terms of things to keep things cold. And Beard insisted the enzymes had to be freshly prepared, very freshly prepared, and that if they used stuff that had been sitting around, it wouldn't work properly. But this was all very convoluted. And in the meantime, somebody else came along who was a lot more persuasive than Dr. Beard, a diary of one of his students from the era describes Beard as one of the most boring men that ever lived. And in the meantime, someone more, more interesting came along with something that promised to be an easy, non-toxic, effective method of treatment for all cancers. And that was Madame Curie and radiation. Radiation in that era was billed as a treatment for just about anything. And in fact, here's an advertisement for a face cream that you could use if you wanted to help your complexion to regain its youthful glow. Uh, but uh, it would be another 10 or 15 years before people realized that radiation was not universally successful. It was certainly not non-toxic. The early uh, practitioners, like Madame Curie, for example, would actually wind up dying of radiation toxicity themselves. But by that time, Dr. Beard was dead and gone, and a lot of the arguments about his uh, ha and an interest in his work had also passed away. There were some other practitioners over the years um, that used injectable enzymes with some success. There was a Dr. Morse in the 1930s in um, St. Louis. There was a Dr. Shively who got some attention for using injectable enzymes in the 1960s. But when the FDA got wind of what Dr. Shively was doing, they criticized him for not starting with animals first, and they also took injectable enzymes completely off the market. So it's not possible to do any kind of follow-up studies with that. The product doesn't exist anymore. Um, but fortunately, Dr. Kelly, around the same time, serendipitously discovered that pancreatic enzymes taken orally could have an effect as well because he felt that tumor in his abdomen changing when he took them. Now, um, one of the critiques that Nick and I would get in the 1980s, early 1990s, when we were trying to you know, get more scientific interest in this work going, was that people said, oh, there is absolutely no evidence that pancreatic enzymes have anything to do with cancer or this whole business about the trophoblast. None of this makes any sense at all. But since then, there's been a bit more research, and so that's what I'd like to talk about now. First of all, Beard's theory that the trophoblast and cancer are very, very similar. Is there research to show that? Yes, there is. Um, there are a number of articles, and I've got some references here. Obviously, you won't have time to write this down. I'm happy to you know, point you in the right direction afterwards if you're interested. But these are a couple of articles that describe that the molecular mechanisms that the trophoblast and that cancer use are the same or extremely similar um, for their invasion for the angiogenesis, forming new blood vessels, for their effect on the immune system. So all of what Beard said was correct. Next up, are pancreatic enzymes made in early fetal life? Yes. Pancreatic enzymes are formed in the embryo actually even a little earlier than what Beard realized. So pancreatic enzymes uh, most likely have a big role besides digestion because they're made very, very early on. Another question, are there, is there evidence to suggest that those proteases are doing something in the trophoblast and in cancer? And it turns out that there are receptors for proteases in both the trophoblast and in cancer. Um, so it would seem that there is a way that, that uh, these proteases can be signaling the trophoblast cells and cancer cells to modify their behavior. These protease-associated receptors, um, there's four actual types of them, um, and PAR2 is the one that's associated with trypsin, which is the, the prevalent uh, protease in the pancreatic enzyme mixture. And so uh, 
it, it turns out that trypsin at the present time is believed to contribute to metastases as opposed to tumor control. But they also, the research also says that this is all in its very, very early stages. Um, PAR2 is the least well studied. Um, the other uh, protein associated receptors are involved with thrombin, um, which is involved with clotting, um, which is a much bigger problem and probably much better researched. A lot of pharmacological interest in modifying uh, those particular pathways. Um, so the PAR2 uh, receptor it hasn't been all that well uh, characterized. And there were some investigators a few years back um, who speculated that actually um, it may be the precursor enzymes as opposed to the active pancreatic enzymes that play a role in the management of cancer. Um, and so there's, there's a few loose ends here, but this, the research is definitely heading in the direction that Beard was absolutely right. Um, a few other oh, a few other questions, and my apologies for this uh, this slide, which is in a newer version of PowerPoint than what I've got on the computer here. Uh, so can oral enzymes be absorbed? That's another question that comes up a lot. People say, well, these enzymes are very big molecules and they'll just sit in the gut and won't get absorbed. But in fact, um, there are studies that show that large molecules can be absorbed from the gut, and specifically that the body may well have its own mechanism of recycling our own pancreatic enzymes, that they're secreted in the gut, and then if they're not destroyed, they just get absorbed and reused, a nice little efficient way of not having to rebuild new enzymes every time you eat a meal. And the last reference on there, um, the investigators actually put radioactively labeled trypsin into the intestinal tract of some volunteers, and I, I hope they paid them well. Um, but uh, they, they, they put radioactively labeled trypsin into the gut and found that it was found intact in the bloodstream a little while later, so it was clearly absorbed and intact. Uh, another question that we get a lot, aren't pancreatic enzymes just destroyed in, pancre in the stomach acid? And this, uh, they're, they're in the pharmacological world, um, they, they coat pancreatic enzymes to be sure that they're protected from stomach acid. But when Dr. Gonzalez and I went through the literature trying to find the evidence that pancreatic enzymes are actually destroyed by, by stomach acid, we couldn't find anything. What we found was articles referencing another article that referenced another article that referenced another article in which the opinion that acid destroyed pancreatic enzymes was expressed, and then it went to another article, which went back to the 1880s, finally, and that person was basically just theorizing that that was what they thought. It turns out some investigators in Russia put this to the test by practically boiling pancreatic enzymes in acid. And what they found is that pancreatic enzymes are inactive in stomach acid, but they're not destroyed. If you cool them off, you know, after this boiling process that they did, if you cool them off and then change the pH back to alkaline, the enzymes work just fine. So investigators, well, first of all, there wasn't much investigation. And secondly, people were assuming that just because the enzymes were inactive in acid that that meant they were destroyed when they were just kind of hibernating, so to speak. Um, so all of the, or most if not all of the theoretical material that I just described was included in the book, um, The Trophoblast and the Origins of Cancer, which Dr. Gonzalez and I co-authored, and which is also available on Amazon. A few other basic science type uh, research, um, some animal models, and here I'm just looking at the animal studies that were done with the product that we ourselves use. Um, breast cancer, there was an implantable rat mammary tumor study that was done a while back. Now the investigators insisted that the only way to get the enzymes down the animals was to mix it into their food. And this is completely contrary to the way we give enzymes, which is away from meals. And and so uh, the research, the study didn't work out quite as well as we would have liked it to, but they did find that there was one group of animals um, at one particular dose uh, mixed with magnesium, and that group had fewer tumors developed than the control group. But their net conclusion was, we need more studies and we need more rats, and uh, that never happened. A more uh, 
more interesting study from my point of view was done with a model of pancreatic cancer in mice. And in this case, they administered the enzymes to the animals that got it in the water supply. And presumably, they were drinking water all day long, and so they would get some enzymes away from their food. Uh, and um, what they found was that the survival of the mice um, was significantly prolonged when they got the pancreatic enzymes. Bear in mind also with this is that we're, we're just guessing in terms of enzyme doses for rats and mice. So while, of course, we would have loved to have had all the, the mice that got the, um, the enzymes do fabulously well, um, it would require quite a bit of dosing experimentation, which I'm not really interested in curing cancer in mice anyway. Um, so uh, then in terms of our own research, um, it, you know, Dr. Gonzalez, uh, Nick had studied with Dr. Kelly up until around 1986, 1987, and that was when um, he was, we were trying to get that manuscript that he'd written about Dr. Kelly published. Um, and um, so Nick had submitted bits and pieces of it to medical journals, you know, individual cases, and the response uh, generally was, these cases can't possibly be true, you're making all this up, um, we don't believe you and we're not going to publish it. Um, and then when he uh, wanted to try to get the manuscript as a whole published, um, there were two responses there um, from, from conventional publishers. One was that uh, this is a very important book and we hope somebody else publishes it, but our medical division would have a really big problem if we were the ones that did it. Or in some cases, they didn't believe it either. Um, and in many ways, I think that was a more difficult era for this type of work um, than it is now, although I still wouldn't describe it is uh, particularly easy, um, but it's gotten a lot better since then. Regardless, Nick was unable to get that manuscript that he'd written published. And this had a very bad effect on Dr. Kelly. Um, he had had a very rough life. Um, and I'll get into that a little bit more, I believe, in the second hour of this. And so um, he wound up uh, getting a little strange, and he was not no longer practicing at that point. And so Nick and I went back to New York, where Nick was from, um, to try to start up again without Dr. Kelly, in effect, to try to recreate the method and gather case reports in order to try to make some headway with all of this. And so Nick set up practice in 1987. I wound up going back to finish up my medical, uh, my internal medicine training, got my boards and all that, and then joined him in practice in 1991. In 1993, um, Nick presented uh, some cases at the National Cancer Institute, 25 cases of patients with clearly documented cancer. Some of the cases that I've talked about, uh, like the, the woman that I started with, was one of the cases that he presented at that time. And so based on that presentation, the National Cancer Institute folks suggested that we do a pilot study, and they suggested specifically pancreatic cancer, again, because it has a fairly uniformly nasty prognosis. Um, and so they suggested doing a pilot study. They didn't offer any funding or anything, but they offered, they said, you should go do this and let us know when you're done. Um, so we did wind up getting funding for the study, and uh, the pilot study ran from 93 to April of 1996. Um, we had 11 patients enter. The median survival was 17 months as compared with four to six months for typical historical controls. And quite frankly, we would have done better than that if we'd gotten better support in some cases for patients having problems um, from their local doctors. But regardless, the results were really, really positive. And so based on that, um, the next step was to do a larger clinical trial. And um, you know, just quoting something that one of the doctors speaking yesterday said, uh, you know, case reports are interesting, but the gold standard is really clinical trials. And I agree with that if you can get them done. Um, the trouble with a lifestyle study is you know, things can be a little bit challenging when you're trying to study that, especially when you're working with doctors who are accustomed to a more pharmacological model. In other words, the patient comes in, they stick out their arm, you put in the drug, you know they got it, and that's all there is to it. Um, with a program like ours where patients have to go home and do it, life can get a little more challenging. Um, so we got the funding to do a direct comparison of our regimen with chemo in patients with unresectable pancreatic cancer. 
The study uh, was a mess, to be perfectly blunt. Um, some of the problems, uh, a lack of a lead-in period. In our pilot study, we had had a four-week period where patients went home to see if they could actually do it. Um, and if they couldn't or they wouldn't, they weren't entered into the study. With the clinical trial, the doctors absolutely refused to have such a lead-in period, and the net result was that, as it says there, 11 of 39 patients either never started or dropped out within a week. Um, another problem, um, patients were told that they needed to go see a doctor somewhere once a month. And for chemo studies, this is relevant because chemo is toxic. And so people can develop liver problems, you know, kidney problems, all sorts of problems. And so they get routine blood work to see what's going on. Our, problem, our program doesn't really have those issues. But nonetheless, our patients would go see local doctors. Most of the patients did not live in the New York area, so they couldn't see them to see See us, and what they would get would be monthly discouragement. If they were feeling well, they were told, oh, it's so sad that you're spending the last months of your life eating this terrible diet. Not that it's all that terrible, but that's what they heard. If they weren't doing well, they were told, you need to change to chemotherapy immediately. And not surprisingly, uh, compliance suffered. And then we had no role in patient selection, so we couldn't object if they tried to admit somebody that was completely ineligible, and that happened a few times. Um, so the net result, epidemic non-adherence. Again, I'm sorry about this slide. It's a little messy, but 30 of 39 patients followed not at all, incompletely or briefly. And at a meeting, um, we had some rather contentious meetings on this topic, and a letter by somebody from NCAM, one of the sponsors, supported that everybody agreed that this was a big problem. Nonetheless, uh, the investigators involved wound up publishing an article um, saying that our program didn't work and leaving out all the information about compliance. So we made a valiant effort. We tried our best to do what I still believe was the right thing to have done, but what it meant was that uh, there's something published in the literature that says what we do doesn't work. Now, uh, Dr. Gonzalez actually wrote an entire book on the subject called What Went Wrong? Um, the Truth About Behind the Clinical Trial of the Enzyme Treatment of Cancer. I wrote a considerably shorter piece called Research Battles, Survival Tips from a Veteran, where I talk about the problems in trial design that probably contributed to all of this. But there is one good thing that came out of this study, um, and that is um, a particular patient who, here, here we are, and I'm getting choked up again. Um, <laughs> so um, this, this patient um, went to her doctor in the fall of uh, 2000 with weight loss and some abdominal complaints, and I have to hand it to her doctor. She sent her straight to a CAT scan. That doesn't always happen. Um, and what they found was that she had a cancer in her pancreas. They biopsied it. They sent the slides to a second hospital, the Mayo Clinic, for review. And everybody agreed that she had the nasty kind of pancreatic cancer and adenocarcinoma. She was offered surgery, but she refused. And now, I don't always disagree with surgery for cancer, but in the case of the Whipple procedure, which is what she was looking at, I can totally understand her point of view because it's a big operation. It can have its own mortality. People die from this operation, and it only works about 25% of the time. 75% of the people that get a Whipple will wind up having a recurrence and die from pancreatic cancer. So it's by no means a slam dunk that you're going to be cured with this particular procedure. And so um, she saw several doctors, all of whom tried to talk her into surgery and all of whom failed. And then she heard about this clinical trial, and she sent her paperwork in to the academic institution um, dealing with the, the screening and the management of this thing. And they looked it over, and they said, sure, go ahead, fly across the country to be a part of this study. And then when she got there, they looked at the papers, the same papers that she'd sent ahead of time, and they said, wait a minute, you can get surgery. Why aren't you getting surgery? And she said, well, I don't want to get surgery. And they said, well, this study is only for people that can't have surgery. And she said, well, what's the difference between me that doesn't want to get surgery and somebody else you might put in this study that can't get surgery? And they said, it doesn't matter. You can't be in the study. 
She showed up to my office later that day, as I recall. Admittedly, it's been a while, so maybe our, our re recollections might be slightly different. But my, my recollection is that she showed up for her first appointment with me later that day in tears because she thought that her only hope had been taken away from her. And I went ahead and treated her off protocol. Um, she, she, she couldn't qualify for the study itself. I didn't actually charge her. I felt like the whole experience had been you know, pretty, pretty negative for her, flying all the way across the country for a chart review that could have been done before she got on the plane. But regardless, um, I, I felt very bad that this had been mishandled, and also I wanted to take care of her, and she's still with us today. Um, so the last time we did is, uh, you know, she, she is still alive. Um, she's here today. So that would put her, what, 15 years out, 15 and a half years out. So, um, Anne, if you want to stand up and wave, feel free. Right, so Anne is another one of those people that is why I do what I do. Um, and I, you know, it, it would have been wonderful to have been able to complete a formal clinical trial, but in the meantime, what we have are case reports. And remember, spontaneous regression is a mighty rare thing. So when I have a practice that's got a number of people like Anne in it, I have to feel like I've got something positive to follow up on, and I have to feel like I need to continue no matter what. So with that, um, that is the end of the first session, um, and I believe that you probably need a break at this point. Um, so we'll see you back in about, what, 10 minutes? Okay? All right, thank you.